morning, everybody. That's okay. <laughs> it's being recorded. Is that yes? Okay. So before we get our presentation today, I just wanted to go over a few highlights of uh, CARS March sales information. And the headline reads, California home sales lost steam in March while median home price hits seven month high. So prices are going up, sales are slowing. Existing single family homes, and this is statewide, totaled 267,470 units in March on a seasonally adjusted but annualized rate down 7.8% from 290,020 units in February and down 4.4% from 279,700 units in March. So the rate of sales are declining month over month for this year so far. Holden, you're seeing that yourself. You said the market's changing. March's statewide median home price was $854,490, up 6% for February and up 7.7% from $793,260 in March of 2023. Year to date, statewide home sales are up 0.7%. So the information just suggests that the rate of sales are slowing in California right now because we're up in January, we're up in February but then we were down in March. So overall, the rate of sales continued to decline, unfortunately. Unsold inventory statewide decreased 13.3% on a month over month basis, but increased from March of 2023 by 23.8%. So year over year, from the month of March, the increase in inventory statewide was up almost 24%, pretty substantial. But the in unsold index inventory, excuse me, index measures, which measures the number of months needed to sell the supply of homes on the market at the current sales rate, dropped from three months in February 2000, excuse me, February 2024 to 2.6 months in March. The index was at 2.1 months in March of 2023. In March of 2023, it only took 2.1 months to sell a property. March of 2024, 2.6 months. So the, the pace of sales are diminishing. And then let's just talk about Orange County itself. Orange County, the median price of an existing single family home was a million four, $1.4 million. February is million three fifty. That's an increase of 3.7% in one month. It's huge if you think about it. The median sold price in March of 2023 was $1,253,000. Prices went up 12% year over year based upon the median price. And in sales, the month to month change, it was up 23.1%, but sales year to year were down 3.8%. So it's suggesting overall in California and in Orange County, the rate of sales are diminishing. Prices continue to go up that certainly is affecting affordability and inventory is starting to increase. So if inventory increases or competition, probably less uh, opportunities for a seller to get multiple offers on a property. And you're saying that Holden, but that most recent property, as a matter of fact, that one escrow, as a matter of fact, the number of offers has slowed compared to some of the other transactions. Although you have a seven day close on that one. And he's feeling really cocky about that because he's had a five day, a 10 day and a seven day close here recently in the last three or four weeks. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, <be> sorry. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You can get it. Yeah. All, right? So when speaking to clients, what is, what do we want to say? Well, more inventory is coming on the market. The rate of sales are diminishing. If you want to wait, is it, wait, is it going to really benefit you? That's a good question. But still overall, Real estate seems to be a good investment, but the inventory is up. But I think in South County, it's not it's not as high as the rest of the county, like in Irvine. Uh, certain, well, certain areas it may not be as high, right? right? I'm just giving a generalization, so that could be very well true. As a matter of fact, it's probably why the price is still going up. It's yeah, insane. but we're seeing more and more people moving out of Irvine because of the affordability. So they're moving farther south or farther east. Rancho Santa Margarita seems to be the next target for so many people. You can see the change in the demographics. Any questions about that before we begin? 
Nope. Okay. All right. So we have two guest speakers today, and I'm going to ask them to both come up to the front, please. Brian and Holden, that means you too. Thank you. I want to make sure everyone can see their faces. Are you in front of the camera? I don't know. You can see it on there. Is it on mine? Okay. All right, great. It, this this right camera there. here, but you can see it on yours. We can't see it on this one. So Holden was originally licensed in May 6, uh, excuse me, 1999. So the record show, right? Brian's license was issued April 15, 2005. He obtained his broker's license in August of 2006. So just because you had your license, how long have you been a realtor? Um, boy, I'd have to think many. Oh, it's okay. si since that time. Uh -huh. it's been oh, you did. So you did. Once you obtained your license, you made this a full time endeavor. Yeah, it is. I was 19 when you got your list. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got mine in 2000, I think you said five or six, five and but I took a few years off to go work for the Irvine company for a while and get that nice steady easy paycheck. And then I started doing this, I want to say probably around 2010 or 2012. Yeah, I think you've been here ever since you started in the industry. So like 12 you? to 15 years, somewhere in that ball. Wow, good decision, Brian, I have to say. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, it's been great. <laughs> so are there any neighborhoods that you specialize in? Absolutely, yes. You want to tell us? Yeah, College Park, Colony, and um, Green Tree in, in Irvine. Yeah. And the reason I have, I have two different people up here all the time, well, last week or two weeks ago, if you saw Archana and Shweta, they each had two different approaches, and these two individuals also have different approaches. Now, Brian, do you have a specific area that you market or fund? No, I don't. I'll say, you know, Holden is the guy to go to if you want to learn about farming, how to get those leads, how to generate that pipeline. I mean, I'm in awe of what this guy does, you know, just with his uh, burning through his tennis shoes on a daily basis, just going in and out and farming those areas. I wish I could be better at that. I would probably be a lot more successful if I was. Um, I started off trying to do something that not a lot of agents were doing because I felt like I wasn't going to be an agent until I cashed that first check. You know, you, you can go into any office and probably start learning and taking some training and getting some classes and feeling like you know what you're doing. But until you cash that first check, you don't really feel like you've made it. And so I found the little loophole of leases. You can, you can cash a check on a lease in about a week if you just show some people around. And so I ended up doing that over and over and over again, because not a lot of agents were interested in doing leases, working with tenants, helping them find places and, uh, you know, cash that first check easily, realize, man, I could probably do this again. And, um, you know, nobody else, not all the other agents were clamoring. I know Holden has uh, got himself a strong foothold in all of the areas he farms. He is the guy. You want to go into his area, you're going to have to compete with him. You're the little guy going up against Goliath. Um, in the leasing front, you didn't have that. Um, it's a lot more work. Uh, it's not as easy. But to give an example, one of the person, first people I placed in a lease, it was probably a $2,400 a month lease. That person ended up turning into four sales transactions. He bought, he sold, he referred his father who sold, he referred his brother who sold. And so that one, gosh, it must've been like an $800, $1,200 leasing commission turned into well over six figures in cash commissions just from that one contact. And so it can be a lot of work, but as long as you're looking down the road at the payoff, it's all about meeting the people and making those connections, whether they come from a lease or whether they come from knocking on a door. That's what you got to learn to be good at if you want to be successful in life. Cool. How about you, Holden? <clears throat> in terms give of- us, Give us a description of your, of your week. Of my week? Yeah, of a week. Well, I spend the first part of my day, the, the mornings farming every day. Um, that's how I start my day. And uh, I, I keep a calendar so that I don't lose track every day of what I'm doing, because as you start to get deeper into the business and, and in it for a longer time and get more transactions and more acquainted with people in the area, too many things I've experienced come at me at once and it can be tremendously overwhelming. So I keep everything very scheduled um, so I know exactly what I'm doing. So like I said, days can change in this business um, the client comes first. If someone calls you and tells you they need to see you at 830 in the morning, well, that's that's my farming time. Um, everything changes and they come first. 
So you, you always need to remember that. I've learned uh, client comes first because in this business, which is what we're talking about, if they want to see me at 830 in the morning and I can't be there till 1030, they'll call my competitor or the next person. And I'm not just thinking that that has happened. So I don't do that. Um, when when somebody wants to see me at a certain time, I change plans, family plans, business plans, everything. So so my mode of operation is farming first, and then I tend to um, second part of the day look at business operations, which is a whole different thing. But sometimes, like I said, per client, they things can change. Um, that's been my experience, um, and without for me, without farming, I have nothing. I seem to have built everything from farming somehow. And when I started doing this, um, farming real hard, I remember the day it was on a July 4th. Um, and I distributed to my one farm then, which I was only doing a quarter of that farm. And that changed very quickly in a matter of days. Um, I distributed um, 4th of July flags. Um, but it, it just goes from there. Um, when I'm, I, I, I don't door knock. When I'm walking around, um, I, I don't want someone to knock on my door. If someone knocks on my door, I'd invite them in and tell them all about real estate, especially if they're an agent. I don't, I don't want someone knocking on my door. But I, I leave my flyers and I talk to people. And th the whole thing is to be able to make that face-to-face -face contact. For me, not on the phone face to face they remember you then they see your picture on the flyer they know who you are and um by god it is working let me tell you um if you think this is a bad market it's not you just have to position yourself correctly and that's a fact because there's buyers and sellers in every market you just have to be in position and and in my case they have to know me so that's my experience on a daily basis, um, even today. I'll say the thing I heard from that that really caught my attention is the greatest ability you have is your availability. <laughs> You've heard that before in like the sporting sense. Um, and that's what you're talking about when the phone rings and someone wants to see you. If you're available, that's going to be your greatest asset. They do not want to have to wait two or three hours for your call back because he's right. They're going to go and call other people. They're going to send texts. And then the other thing I'd say is like learn how that person likes to communicate. You know, for example, if outside of, uh, you know, what I do for a living, I feel a lot of phone calls from vendors and things like that are pretty intrusive. You know, I could be out there playing with my kids and my phone's ringing and now I'm thinking I've got a work emergency I've got to deal with. Um, and I pull it up and I'm, you know, I, I find that to be a little obnoxious just to get the random phone calls out of the loop. But there are some people that only want to talk to you via phone call. So you got to learn to adapt. If you're sending someone a text message as your, you know, one of your first earliest contacts and they're not responding to your text message, maybe they're a phone person. Get used to calling them on the phone. If you're calling them on the phone and they're sending you to the voicemail every time and responding with the text, get used to texting. That's how they want to be contacted. So be available for the client and communicate in the method they want to communicate it. That's gonna set you apart first and foremost from anybody else they might be talking to. And then from there, you gotta build the relationship with your doctor. Absolutely, and you said something that, that gave me a feeling about something that took me a long time to learn. Um, for me, when I bring this up, it is per listing appointments, but it can be in any, any reaction with a client. Um, it's very important you you're in this business as we are we're dealing with all sorts of personalities all sorts of nationalities and personalities so on that note we have to be very um Brian, i'm trying to think of what you you reminded me very um cautious how we approach people for me i let people talk for example on a listing appointment um and again this could apply into any interaction with client i'll look at them i know what they want i know why i'm there hi how can i help you after we've talked after introduction i don't bring it up hi how can i help you let them bring it up oh 
great. Well, here's how we proceed. Um, that that is uh, that seems to work for me a lot. Listen, react. Don't sit down with them and tell them about the mark and give them your own opinion. They don't want to hear that. How can I help you? That's what I do. And it works. So you're not in there selling yourself initially. You're getting the, them to tell you what they want so then you can then gauge what their what their needs are. 200%. Because <laughs> everyone's different. Everyone wants to sell. Everyone in my case, because of what I do, they know my face. Most of the people, um, I got a listing yesterday. She's never met me before. Okay. I better make a convincing presentation and I, I better, you know, make her think I'm very confident, um, which, which fortunately I've done. Believe me, I don't get every listing and that's the nature of this. But um, um, yeah, that you they have to believe in you. And in order to accomplish that, um, you have to get their, their confidence in you, as I said, but you have to be very careful with all of these different personalities and let I let them come at me, ask me and tell me what they want and then go from there. I don't throw things at them and it usually always works. So what's, what's your listening presentation consists of? What do you bring with you? And that's everything. I've been so, what's the word? Fascinated, engrossed by listing presentations for most of my real estate career. That's been my just obsession. Um, and I used to prepare books and, and it, no, I, I take, again, since I work in these areas, who I am, um, okay, the thing that I need to bring is comps. Sometimes I'll bring flyers uh, um, of myself showing properties I've sold so they can see what I've done in their area. Um, I'll bring appreciation letters, um, which is another thing um, it's good to have from past clients that have worked with me. Um, I will bring, um, okay, this is imperative. I know in this day and age, we do everything online, including the listing agreements. I always, and trust me, and I'll give you a current example, always bring your listing contract to the listing presentation. So don't assume you're gonna go back to the office and do it online. Maybe you will, but always bring the listing contract. Guess what? When I got that listing yesterday, I it was in person with the listing contract in my hand, okay? Um, not online, okay? I've done plenty online, but you always, you don't know. So you always go with the listing contract and you have to do it longhand, do it. Um, the main thing I always remember to bring is the listing contract. Like I said, even in this age of computers, um, comps are imperative. Um, again, guys, it depends on who you're talking to and what they know. It's such a, a widespread. Some may know every agent competitor of you there. Some have already talked to your competitor agents. They know the comps, everything. Some don't know anything. Um, and, and you have to tell them. So that's what we're up against in, in, in any farm. I speak from experience in three farms uh, that I do. Um, pretty much the comps, myself, the listing contract. Um, and, and like I said, other times, um, flyers of, of accomplishments I've done, which you want to have on hand. Is there anything else that you're thinking? No, no. I just, I think everybody wants to know what you do. That, that, that's, that's what I do. Thinking. That's what I do. And it's hitting it. Okay. Here's the big secret. That's not a secret. Come to the office every day. If you don't know what the hell you're doing, look at people, talk to people, figure it out every day. That's what I did for many, many years. And I didn't even know which way was up at first. I didn't know, I didn't know what a comp was. I didn't know anything, okay? And come every day, talking to people, putting this stuff together. You wanna make some money? <laughs> there is big opportunity in this job and everyone here can do it. What I think would be cool to learn from 
Holden or Jane, Sarah, Mike Dunn, the people that really know how to farm and market and spend those marketing dollars. I'd almost like to see like a menu that lays out, okay, if this is your marketing war chest, I would recommend twice a month using this uh, method. I don't know, maybe printed flyers, twice a month, printed flyers. If you can afford $500 a month, get a farm that's like 200, 300 houses. This is how you start. So if you're a new agent, it's great to talk about what you're going to do when you get in the room and you're given that listing presentation. But I think for a lot of new agents, just the thought of getting the leads is what slows a lot of them down. Where do you get the business? Obviously, you have your friends and family you're going to want to talk to, and you hope you can build that network. But it would be great to have something from all the best marketers here. Like, all right, maybe you're coming into this with a huge war chest saved up of $10,000. What's the best way I could spend that money? Maybe you're like me when I came in and I didn't have two coins to rub together. Okay, maybe I can get $200. $50 a month or maybe I'll go lease some houses and next month I'll, I'll spend a thousand dollars on marketing. What would you recommend I put that money in? I think if there was an opportunity to just talk to some of the best farmers in the office and get some feedback on that, that would be probably valuable to well, a lot I of people. I think we have an opportunity with one of them right now. So hold on. <laughs> no, you're, you're right. I, I so how many times your clients receive something, right? Whether it's from oh. you personally or being delivered. Uh, and then also, I was just thinking there's something else that was so critical in regards to that, but your calendar, you have it laid out such that Holden does two things. He has a calendar of what his daily activities are going to be, correct? Yes. And in addition to that, for the areas he's walking himself or having somebody else deliver or mail, he has it outlined by tract. Which yeah. You've got yeah. a map of each and every tract and 150 to 200 homes typically involved in one day's marketing session, right? Mm -hmm. So when he chooses a farm, that's how detailed he is in regards to what's going to take place. And it creates accountability because he has so many homes he must market to every single day. And then also, are, you're good at budgeting. You maintain all your expenses. That's everything. So can I, can I no, say, please, no. with the, with the, <laughs> this, I just, I, came into this a long time ago. I'm just thinking of, of what Rich just said. So when you choose a farm, the way that I do it, and if anybody wants more specific help and advice, I'm available anytime and happy to. Um, I, I, I get a, um, a layout of, of the farm from Mary title. Um, basically what I'm saying is the farm <laughs> and then all the house homes in the farm so right away, I know how many homes I'm, I'm dealing with, and then I'll break it down on the map. Um, and, and I took a, a while to do this with my newest farm that Cindy and myself are, are working. Um, I'll take the map and I'll break it down into, um, for, for my foot farming, section one, section two, section three, section four, and then I'll, I'll even go and divide those sections. Anyway. What I what this does is I'll know each day which homes I'm hitting. Okay, so do you see the how how specific this is? You are you know exactly there. There's so many homes you're dealing with. You know exactly how many times you're hitting each home on foot. And then I do other forms of marking every month, so I know exactly how many times I'm hitting each of these homes. How many times is that? Well. Um, with in the mail, it would be twice a month on foot myself. It's once a month. And then I have someone else doing it on foot. So it's another time a month off the top of my head in a normal month. Then it would be about what, four times. Um, and there's variations in, in, in the year and so forth. I have activities in the farm, so forth. But in terms of the farming, um, I, I've heard of a lot of people that they just choose the farm even prior to my doing this and they'll and they'll just go out and do a certain amount of houses and then the next day they'll pick up and do the other. I mean, it's it's so random and then you miss a day and you don't know which ones you haven't hit. That's why I do it very specific like this. Um, and um, my God, it seems to have worked. So um, it's very important to be very clear on what you're doing. So like, you said that you started like a new farm recently. Probably, yeah. Like you, if you hit that like four times a month, yeah. do you think that you start seeing results from that? When? Yeah. Like how, how long did it take for you? 
see results from that far. Well, in terms of results, I mean, we got an appointment, a listing appointment. I didn't get the, the he didn't list with anybody, but we got that in a couple of months. It took me longer in my original farm. It took me a lot longer than that. But boy. I, I got to I gotta tell you, um, Holden Farms, whether it's raining or it's 100 <laughs> degrees outside, if it's raining, he brings in his, his umbrella. He's got a puffy jacket. I got He's got boots. his rain boots on. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. Like for everybody that says, uses his excuse that, oh, the weather's not great today. This guy's out every day when it's raining. Yeah. He's out every day when the sun's blazing at 100 degrees or whatever, you know, the hottest days are. So that that's great. I, uh, that's yes. Exciting. Yes. The, the other thing I was going to say was when you do your flyers, you you said that you just like leave them on the doors and stuff. Yeah. Um. When you when you say also like it's better to get like face to face. Yeah. Does it just come from people contacting you? from like when you leave the flyers or do they just kind of like come to the door when they see you? I love it. Let me tell you, it is everything, but here's how I think about it. I always want to be, let's just say by 830, as we said earlier, on in the farm on foot every morning. Okay. I have noticed over my years of doing this, that, and this sounds silly, but this is big that different people in the farm are at home at different times. They're, they're out walking at different times. So then at different, some if I'm not there at 8.30 in the morning every day, then sometime I'm there at one o'clock in the afternoon, you have a different group of people. It's that, it, it, it's make, I tell you, it's making the face-to-face, -face, okay, contact. Let me give you a current example. I just closed a property a couple weeks ago, Picasso, okay? I tell you, it was in the colony. I have to tell you, okay? These people, they were smart. They owned a business themselves that they ran for 40 years. They knew what was up, okay? You know what the first thing they said to me on our first appointment was? And Cindy, you heard it. They said, Holden, we see you walk. And they were, they've been in that house since the early 80s. Holden, we see you walking around here all the time. And you always say hi to us. You always wave and say hi to us. Okay. They said that. Okay. And I do. I wave. It sounds stupid. I wave at cars and they wave back. I wave at people and they wave back. And this time it got me a listing, right? I think it goes to uh, what Jay was saying uh, in the past about being professional when you're an agent. Um, Agents, we have kind of a bad rap. It's, you know, the six figure job you can get without any sort of education at all. And it can attract a certain group of people that don't want to work hard. And the way Holden and Jay and all these people set themselves apart is they show that they work hard. And he shows it just by walking the neighborhood several times a week. When people are thinking about agents, they don't know if the guy that just came in and gave them their listing presentation spends the first seven hours of his day playing video games before he, you know, puts on his, his, shirt and goes out the door, but they know Holden's out there at 8.30 in the morning. So I think if you present yourself professionally, it's going to set you apart from a lot of agents that are out there. Um, I, I had a question about meat versus candy when it comes to marketing. So I don't know how to produce the content for the consistent level of marketing that you would do, foot farming and things. You know, when it comes to meat, I would consider that things like um, area home sales, you know, the latest sale flyer or something like that. That's actual information I can use. Some of the stuff Rich talks about, the, the trends in Orange County, that's some good hard data people use compared to like the candy, which is the American flag in your front yard. I, I imagine you're not going to get serious business as much if you're just out there handing out recipe books and calendars mm -hmm. and flags. People are going to expect this content that you have to know how to produce that gives them actual information. Is that right? Do you think someone could be successful if they're just out there subscribing to this farming service that just gives you, you know, Dodger schedules on a calendar and magnets and things like that? Are you at, are you saying handing out things? Yes. What do you what do you use as part of your marketing materials? Right? What content? Yeah, you know, what kind of content do you distribute typically? I can tell that, but am I answering it correctly if I say it's that person-to-person -person contact more than anything you do? Guys, this okay. is called branding. Branding. Do you know what that means? Branding an area. Okay. So um, whatever you put out there. Okay. Let me tell you, 
what I remember, Carlos, what I put out a couple years ago during COVID, um, the disinfectant, little bottles of disinfectant. You know? It doesn't matter what you put out, in my opinion. It matters that they see you. They see me in flyers. They see, they see I'm they, my name on, I've handed out whatever. Is, is that what you're saying? Well, I guess so. I was wondering yeah. if there's like some sort of ratio, but you're saying it's almost unimportant, which R ratio, like how often are you there typing up flyers with, you know, the last 10 sales in the neighborhood versus grabbing Purell and walking around that has your picture on it? Okay. How, what's the proportion here, in your marketing, you think? Here is the thing, okay? Don't take this the wrong way. The magic word is consistency. So consistency means however much you're doing it, if for you, you hit every house once a month, or if for you, you hit every house four times a month, whatever, I don't care. Consistency, they know you're gonna be there at that time, they're used to you, uh, they're used to you, they see you. Guys, when I'm walking around, people see me in their houses. I don't even know they're looking at me. I, I know that. And that is the secret. It, it's the personal interaction. Whatever plan works for you, one time, four times, um, consistent, keep doing it. That's what's worked for me. And let me tell you something, for me, it didn't work at first. Okay. We were in, I mean, when I was doing this, we were in a much different time period in different market. Why are you in this business? Does anybody know why they're in this business? Is that a stupid question? I know so. Does anybody want to tell me why we're in this business? I mean, to, to help people. I know what you want. To help people. And what's, that's, I'm asking a stupid question because that's what we're here for. Get it clear in your head. You want money. These are, these. fortunately, I've been able to, to get to that point. And these are the things I've done to do it. What the number one thing is consistency and to have a clear idea of what you're doing. Because I was thrown to the wolves when I first got in this business and I looked at what everybody was doing. Like I said, come into the office every day, looking at what everybody's doing, asking, saying, my God, is that going to work for me? That's too expensive. Let me try this. That didn't work. Try something else. Guess what? Then you find it. Okay. Oh, I was going to say, if I'm hearing you right, it sounds like consistency is the number one thing yeah. in farming. Um, frequency is probably the next most important thing when it comes to farming, how often you're out there getting your face seen. And then coming up in the rear is the actual content you're putting out. While it might be important to some people, it, the first two are a lot more important. Okay, can I say something about content? Content. Can I tell you something funny? When I started and I put out flyers, they were not the hard, if you've ever seen my flyers, they're hard flyer on hard paper now. I put out these um, on typing paper flyers, maybe a, maybe a yellow color, the whole thing. I didn't have any real estate on the, I know you're saying, what's my problem? I didn't have any real estate on the flyer. I'd have for the Easter, a picture of an Easter bunny, join Holden's Easter thing. It was like, the hell was I doing? So with the, the, the farming, what you're putting out there, Brian's talking about content. Yeah, that means something. I don't care what you do. Don't do what I did. Put real estate on the flyer. Now, you're in a company that's been in this area over 30 years. There's other agents, including myself, that would give you permission to use some of their sales on your flyer. So if you haven't sold or leased, use one of mine, use one of someone else's homes, put real estate on your flyer, put your picture on the flyer, put our company name on the flyer. That's content. Um, and then maybe some advertising for yourself. But if you don't have homes and real estate on the flyer, and I speak from direct experience, okay? Because I was, uh, anyway, I know what to do now. And that, that's how you do it. Is that what you mean? Content yes. is real estate, guys. What business are we in? Are we mathematicians or real estate agents? Brand yourself. I have a question for Brian. Yeah. 
you mentioned that you from one of your leases mm -hmm. that turned into four sales. Yes. How was your follow up after that lease? Like how how often did you follow up um, with that lease with that tenant client of yours before you you got the first uh, for sale? I think part okay. of what worked is we just really hit it off. He had a lovely family, really nice guy, and so you know we would check in from time to time. But really, what I used to do back then that I not as good about doing anymore when I work with leases is mark down when that lease ends. You see all the paperwork, you know when that lease ends, mark it down two months ahead of time. Yeah, check in, hey, how you doing? You guys giving any thoughts to, you know, you thinking of buying yet? You thinking of uh, moving on? How, how was your first year in your home? Something as simple as that can spur the conversation. And it turned into actually, we're thinking it's time to buy. We've had a year here, they were moving from the Bay Area. We've kind of seen what we like, we like this area. Um, Excellent. I'm here to help. And that's how we got him into that first house. And from there, you know, we just developed this relationship. So you reached out to them one in one time in one year? Uh, no, there was probably, they were like an acquaintance, you know, a guy I would go maybe have a beer with okay. once every few months, just as it came up, you know, I think we, you know, might have checked in on him because uh, he was expecting a kiddo. And that's a good marketing plan. Have a beer with the client. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it just ended up working out really well. That's that's the best client I've had there. But there have been others, too, where you lease them a home and, you know, they had such a good, good experience with you that they don't want to trust anybody else. They don't want to try anybody else. They know what to expect from you. And I think that's only going to get easier now with this new um, buyers, oh, yeah. exclusive buyers agent agreement. More people now that it's going to be in writing and something that's very official, they're going to want to make sure they're working with someone that they can handle working with for several weeks at a time while they look for a house. So I think that's going to get easier for people. So oh, I'm, investors, Brian, since you work with a number of uh, landlords. <laughs> yeah, um, I, you know, this working with leases and things has kind of rolled itself into um, doing property management. I, I was working for the Irvine company in their property management division for a while. So kind of had my eye on that when I was looking for a place to hang my shingle. And um, that's why this ended up being a good fit. So I ended up getting a lot of um, investor clients, people that don't want to deal with their tenants, but they like the idea of all that passive income. So right now, I'd say my farm mostly is the, the leads that I've generated on my own that are investors that a lot of people are deciding to leave California now for one reason or another. I'd say probably the last, gosh, I don't know, half dozen or so uh, sales I've gotten have been properties I've managed for several years and investors will just say, you know what, I don't think I want to be a landlord in California anymore. I think it's time to sell. And I help them sell, get that nice commission and they end up, you know, maybe you can turn that into a referral out of state if they want to turn that into a property, you know, in Florida or something like that. You might be able to refer that out and get yourself a another form of income there. Um, one thing I was going to say was uh, for the really new agents, again, I told you, my start was I had no money. I needed a check. I started getting those checks by doing leases and just try to find out ways that you can add value to the successful agents in your office. Um, I tried doing that early on. I think Mike Dunn was actually really helpful. Um, I would find lease listings of his, these really nice homes that back then were leasing for $3,500, which <laughs> nowadays would probably be 7,000. I would find some of his and ask, Hey Mike, um, would you mind if I advertise these and try to find renters for you? Yeah, by all means, you know, Mike's too busy selling houses. I don't think he wants to be out there every weekend, you know, showing rentals. And a lot of agents like that, um, you know, have that sort of same attitude. They do the leases as a, to help their clients out. But when it comes to investing a lot of time in it, there just isn't the same return for what they do otherwise. So I would go there and I would take one of Mike's listings. And back in the day, it was, uh, it was Craigslist. I would go on Craigslist and I would post his listing on Craigslist with his permission, with his pictures. And I would just start getting these incoming leads from renters. And ideally, I'll find a renter that I can put in his place and collect that commission. But even on the, the leads I got that I couldn't place in Mike's house, well, now I know what they want. I know that they're actively looking. And I, even if I don't place them in anything right now, I know what sort of residency timeline they're on. Because if they don't find something with me, chances are they're going to rent something just walking into an open house or something like that. But I know they moved in in March 2023, maybe I should keep this phone number and around the beginning of the year in 2024, I'll just check in with them. Hey, it's been a while. I don't know if you remember me. We went and looked at a couple houses together as rentals. Just want to see what are, what are your plans? Are you looking to buy yet? Are you looking to rent? If I was an agent starting out right now, I would try to find out how I can take leads that exist in our office that other agents don't really know what to do with and see if I can turn them into money. Um, I had a, a lease 
for a two bedroom, I ended up with way too many leads. I thought I priced it well. I think I priced it a little low. We ended up getting it up to where it needed to be, but I, I, I ended up with, you know, 30 leads after the fact from people who didn't get this home. And if I had the time to invest, or if there was someone hungry enough in the office that would take those leads, first of all, I would like every one of them called back and say, Hey, look, I'm sorry. This home's been leased, no longer available. Thank you. And just at least acknowledge them because you can imagine as a tenant out there, if you're not even getting a response from the agent you're trying to contact, that's going to leave a bad taste in your mouth. So at the very least, I would like these people to all get a call or a text or something. But then that person who calls those people, they know what this person's looking for. They know the area. Maybe before they make all those phone calls to those leads, they have a short list of three or four properties similar to the one they just missed out on. They could say, I know you missed out on that one. I've got three right here. We could go take a look at them this weekend. What do you think? That's how you can make connections without spending any money initially, if that's where you're at. So find how you can be helpful to other agents in the office that have success. You can go in and search on the MLS for listings in our office just by putting in the office code down at the bottom. It'll populate whether it's sales listings or rental listings and then reach out to those agents. Hey, saw you had this listing over there. Mind if I do an open house for you? Maybe it's a yes, maybe it's a no. Um, I don't know. Things like that I think might work if you're just starting out and don't have the budget to farm yet. Does anyone have any questions? No. It's hard to believe. So representation agreements, fire representation agreements, have either of you used them? This this is kind of um, foreign in, to you. In, yeah, <laughs> we, well, in per of of the upcoming yeah change. No, have not. you? Nope. No. But Holden has actually changed his mindset from <clears throat> not really wanting to work with buyers. He didn't know what buyers were before. <laughs> <laughs> but what? isn't your approach now? If you can as a listing agent to do everything you can to double in the property, whereas maybe two years ago that wasn't uh, necessarily something that was as important to you. Correct. Um, I, I didn't have the same kind of feel mm -hmm. how to, for some reason, how, how to go about that um, as as now. Um, but you have changed that. Fortunately, yes. fortunately, um, yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. Can I can I say? No. It, it's funny okay. because because when I when I started in this business, I, you know, I was taught about how to how to cultivate farms, which is really my my life and breathing in this business. That's that's how I perceive it, and and a lot of other people um, were. Um, you know, we're, we're into the buyer side. I was into the seller side. So, you know, I was, I was taught that the sellers are um, what, what really hold up the business. Here's what I'm trying to say. Who's got the money? Who's got the money? Who sets the price when we, when we, the buyer, <laughs> when we list a property and we sell it, we're putting it out there. Who buys the property? Where's the money come from? That's uh, that's the buyer. So really, um, you know, depending on the economy um, and what what everything in this business is based on emotion and the emotional state of the seller and buyer, and that's all based on the country and the world economy. I mean, it's directly based. So um, if everything's good and 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 it's a seller's market and the seller's commanding the price, but the buyer's the one with the money. So have to re remember that. And, and in terms of doing buyer and seller um, or working with buyers, um, again, you you have to understand the quote well, as we call it, the market that we're in, the economic conditions, the emotion what the buyer is feeling about the area and the world when he's looking to buy. He may go in there and go, I know there's going to be a million offers on this property. This was last year, guys. Oh, and, and, and certainly this year, in some cases, there's going to be a million offers on this property. I have to come up higher, higher, or in a different market where we're only getting one or two offers on a property after four months. Um, we, we, the buyer is the one with the money. I'm I'm jumping around, but I'm I'm trying to um, <clears throat> just point out there's there's the 
the rhythm of this changes so dramatically. And here's the funny part that's not so funny. It changes on a dime. I was in the middle of a listing a few years ago where the market suddenly changed. I saw it and the seller didn't. And he ended up being very mad at me because we weren't getting a lot of offers on all of a sudden. The prices came down all of a sudden. When you're a listing agent and that happens, <laughs> better know how to handle it. So I learned real quick, but um, it, that didn't end well, but the property was sold. Um, the market fluctuates. Right now, it's a very interesting time. Rich is talking about what, what is possibly coming. It's obviously not a law yet in July about what's going to happen in July, but it reminds me of, of something of that, and I don't know a lot about it, what goes on in other states, um, where the buyer pays the, the commission. Um, and that's gonna that's gonna change everything for us. Can I put my two cents into this real quick? I'm excited as hell about that happening, guys. We're gonna get higher commissions on the seller side. Okay. Um, I see that clearly. Um at first, I was terrified. I thought, there goes my whole business. Now, I can't wait. If it happens, let it happen. That's where the buyer is, is paying the commission. Um, seller is um, only paying one side of the commission. Um, it's it's something we really um, could really make us a lot more money. And with. Have any of your sellers approached you about the litigation and how it affects the listing contract or what you're charging them? Currently, so you just took another listing. Is anyone questioning you about the MER litigation? Asking why am I paying the commission to the cooperating broker? Well, that just happened on a listing I just closed. Right, so they did ask. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, the seller understood this. This was a couple of weeks ago, and I spent a very uh, miserable weekend with myself because <laughs> I couldn't talk to him for money. Remember that, Cindy? It was terrible. Um, by the grace of God, these people were smart and they figured it out. And they even wrote me a, a quick appreciation letter somehow. Anyway, um, I thought he hated me, but anyway, what happened was, um, yeah, people, people question about the commission. Um, in, in what he, what he said to me was that he said, what are you doing? I, I thought I'm not paying the buyer's commission. You, you're, you're holding me for everything. That's what you're referring to. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that came right at me a few weeks ago. Um, no. On So what do you do? This, and by the way, this contract, I don't do this all the time. This is another one. Cindy, you were with me. I sat down in front of them and hand wrote the contract. The guy saw everything I was doing. I explained the commission to him anyway. So they said, why are you paying uh, why are you having us pay buyer and seller? And, 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 you know, you take that page, that's the first page of the listing agreement and, and show them um, the text where it says the commission. That's what I did. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, there's a place where you can break it down on there and say um, buyer, pay the buyer this much. I didn't do that. I just, I don't use that. I just put the whole commission there and um, the seller came at me like that. And I had to explain to him um, a couple of things. I had got him the deal that he wanted in the time period he wanted. And I reminded him of that, fortunately. And they that's one thing that was very positive. But he came at me about the commission. And, um, you know, this is while you're in escrow. After you've already put his home in escrow. Toward the end of the yeah. escrow. This yeah. is like in the very last part of it. Um, can I talk about commission and value? Sure. Let me tell you something about this. I don't know what everyone here asks for commission on their um, agreements, but um, unless you know your value, and if you're brand new, let me tell you your value and walk out of this meeting asking for 6%. End of the story, because you are with a company, and this is what you say to these people. Myself and my team, Coldwell Banker, have been in the area over 30 years, okay? For my service and our service, me and my team, 
It's a standard 6% commission, goes right here. Do you have any questions? Done, okay? But that's your value, new or whether you've been in the business, mm -hmm. because that's the value of this company and this team and the team that you're on. So don't ask for anything less because you don't deserve anything less. And when you really know that and really believe it, you walk out of there with that signed and a happy seller. So do it. Well, uh, no, Brian, <laughs> <laughs> just kind of also no, also related to commission. Right. Um, I, I think I've done an incentive-based one before. I discussed with you. Uh, yeah. I propose one. Is that? Should I mention what that is here? Go ahead, Brian. All right. So, you know, I've run into, again, when you're dealing with investors and things like that, a lot of times they're penny pinchers, they're penciling everything out. So I've gotten a lot of pushback on commission. Mm -hmm. If I was as brave as Holden, I probably could have gotten my full 6% every time and I draw the line in the sand. But, you know, sometimes you feel like you gotta got to work a little bit. What I found has worked in the past was to go with maybe a lower number, call it 5%. And I told him, but what I'd like to do is make it incentive basis. If we sell your home for at least $40,000 over asking, let's bump it up to 6%. If I have to do a price cut on your property, we'll go four and a half. So you win. If I have to cut the price, we have to have that unfortunate conversation. But that way, you know, nobody's going to work harder. I make more money when you make more money. And I don't think that pitch is being made by any other agents that are out there. So I've done it a handful of times. And I got to tell you, from, you go from a, someone who's trying to grind you down on commission like crazy to, oh, yeah, no, if I if I can get fifty thousand over over asking, yeah, sure I can pay you an extra nine grand, whatever it is. Um, you can really kind of change their mindset from even the people that really want to grind you down into dust if you're willing to show them that you're willing to work for it. And then there's certain things you got to do in the contract, and when you list it on the MLS, you know, a dual variable, yeah, you know, things like that. You can get all the details from Rich, but if you just want to kind of make it incentive based, I found in a seller's market it works really well. I think I've even gotten 7% once by wow. doing a similar pitch <laughs> and saying, but hey, if we get you, you know, an extraordinary amount higher, can we get 7%? Like so remember, like, that's acceptable wow. between an agent and a seller, but it's not acceptable to offer compensation based upon a, a certain buyers, uh, yeah. aspect happening, right? If you, Mr. Bobbering Broker, if you submit an offer higher or $50,000 more, you can't post compensation based upon certain events taking place. Which is kind of the beauty of this because, you know, back in the day when we could post it on the MLS, I would put on there 2% or 2.5%, two whatever the standard would be for the buyer's agents. But whenever I hit that incentive and it went up, that's not an amount I have to split with anybody. That that stays with me, with our office. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you make the flat rate for the, for the buyer's agent in that case, whatever it was. And then it worked out pretty well. So that, you mean you got more commission than Holden would have won that deal? <laughs> I think if we uh, add things up over the long term, Holden stomps me into the ground when it comes to commissions. But, it's very hard to know, do, Brian. I put food on the table. That's all I need to do. And Brian's a new father once again, too. All right. No, congratulations. Well, does anyone have any questions? No, I'm, I'm just still, I'm really interested to get a bit more detail on the farming aspect of this, because this is, you know, I'm so I'm brand we, we've not met. I'm, I'm brand new. I've done nothing. I feel like I know nothing. Um, and I keep hearing about farming and the multiple ways that people can farm. You clearly have a successful way of doing it. And it, it's interesting to me that you're doing a lot with your boots on the ground, but you're not actually knocking on people's doors. Somehow you're creating, um, as you say, creating your brand, creating a presence for yourself in an area by just being there. And if, if there's any more detail that you can add to that, I'm sure for me and any of the other new agents here, it'd be tremendously helpful. So Holden, when you started farming, what was the size of your farm, if you remember? And then how many more did you graduate to? I was doing when I very, and, and I will address that. I, when I very first started, I'm embarrassed to say, it was 250 homes um, that, that quickly, um, changed. I, I, I understood the concept that the more homes you have, the more chance of response and, and, and you'll get, I mean, obviously, you know, the more homes you have. So, um, I expanded and expanded, um, like, like what, what 
there's all these techniques and methods, etc. What I do works for me, would work for you, for anybody, because it works. But from what I've seen in this business, there's almost an infinity amount of ways to do it. You you come up with or copy somebody however you see fit. But you said a word to me. See, the whole the whole thing is it's not important to to pass out a flyer and it's not important to put someone in someone's door. It's important that they open the door or I don't knock. Okay. It's important that they're in the street walking. Hi. Hi. And and hi, I'm Holden Bow. What do you say? Hi, I'm Holden Bowersuck. I'm your neighborhood realtor. Let them say hi. Then they know who you are. The personal contact is 200%. That's everything. And then, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, let's lay out a playbook for you. Have you identified a farm, any number of houses or anything yet? Have we gotten that far? Probably not. Well, yes. It's okay. Um, Mary's provided me with a list which scared the crap out of me because it's so huge. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, with a very limited budget, I've got to find the best way of focusing in on that area. Um, the, I, I'm more than happy to put in the work, but it's I don't want to waste my time. I want to make sure that whatever I'm doing is going to be effective. So for those like watching at home, the new agents, say the first thing you got to do is identify a farm. It could be 250 homes. It could be 500,000, whatever it is. It could be the small area around your house. You know you can hit that farm because it's right around your house. So any time of day, you can walk out your front door and go hit your farm. It's the 300 homes nearest to me. Maybe that's what it is. But if you have not yet identified a farm, that's number one. You talk to Mary. She's over there. She will help you get a farm. Um, I would say number one is identify your budget. Yes. You think so? Yeah. Okay. So that would identify the size of your farm then. Um, what would you say when it comes to, if you're doing a professional printing service, let's call it flyers. Flyers are probably the easiest thing to do. I went and bought like a $400 laser printer and I did my first set of flyers. Just They weren't pretty, but you know what? I could hit the print button, wait 20 minutes, and then I could walk out my door and hand them off. Again, I never was great at marketing, but you could conceivably do something like that. And that's probably fairly affordable. If you're using a professional print service, let's say you're doing a run of 300 homes, what is that, a quarter mm. piece maybe for a flyer to get printed? I don't know. Holden doesn't know how much it is. Oh, <laughs> I, so, my and so maybe, maybe you find your printer or a printer, get a recommendation in the office from some of the people that use printing, find out what it's going to cost to produce that one piece of paper, and then the rest of it is is sweat. So if you know it's going to cost you 20 cents for a flyer, all right, I've got a budget of you know 200 bucks this month. Well, you're going to be a little limited, but at least you can get started. So identify the farm. Create your content. That was my big bottleneck. I don't know how to make good content. I just never had a class on it. I probably should sit in on it. Maybe if I had that, I would be more inclined to get out there and produce. I just don't have much confidence in what I am handing out. But as Holden said, maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe it's the frequency and consistency that you're doing the handing out of the thing. And uh, what's that? So I guess that's it. Just identify your farm, your budget, print the things, and start walking. Well, that's that's the interesting thing to me, but, um Looking at all the, um, the the direct mailing kind of stuff that you can do, and you can hit a lot more houses that way, but then you don't get any of the personal contact at all. Whereas if you walk around 100 houses in a day, there's a chance, I guess, that you're going to speak to two or three people mm -hmm. and at least get get some kind of interaction with them with it for a lot less money, but a lot more effort, which is just fine. I'm sure the direct mail has an effect at, at a certain scale. I don't know if it has an effect that. I don't know about you, but when I check my mail, I check it over the trash can. It's trash, 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 oh, pile, trash, trash, trash. I think a lot of people do it the same way. Now, if you're mailing out 10,000 pieces or something like that, yeah, you're going to have some sort of retention, I would imagine. I've talked to some of the guys who do that level of marketing. But when you're handing out a flyer, you're putting it on their front door. They're going to take it and give it a look before they throw it in the trash, I think. But when it comes to the mail, you're right. It's just... It's funny because before I started doing this, everything I got from a realtor went straight in the trash can. Now I keep all of them. So now <laughs> I have an idea. I like this. Let me tell you, you just need to start moving and then don't stop. You may have results in a week. You may have results in a month. You may not, but you will have results. I can't tell you the time period, but don't stop because then you've just wasted all that money. But keep that in mind as a motivation not to stop because he will, people will acknowledge you.
Okay. Ask my ask Holden or my brother about garage sales. That's something that they've done, and um, it's it's fairly <laughs> affordable. You go hand out flyers saying we're going to have a garage sale on this date. You go to all the Facebook groups for the area and punch it in there, Craigslist and things, and then you set signs out at the beginning. And then when the uh, let's see, how did Tommy, you did it before, and you would have all the people interested in participating in the garage sale in the community email you, right? Yeah. Say, hey, email me so I can put you on this list. And he made a map. This is a map of the community. These are the addresses that are going to be participating. And you set them at certain areas of the neighborhood so people can come in and grab a map and see which houses are participating. It costs almost nothing. You put out signs the morning of, you take your signs in afterwards, and then you walk around with donuts. Just handing donuts out to all the places that said they were going to participate. Hey, I'm Tommy. Set it all up for you. Here you go. That's it. He's not trying to sell them a house. He's not asking them if they want to sell their house. He's in the community. He made, he solved the problem for these people. They're getting rid of all their clutter and it costs almost nothing. So that's another example of once you have a farm, right. do something like and that. And now he's got email addresses that he can email. Not only hit them uh, with print marketing, but now you're sending them an email. So you're going to be in their mailbox. You're going to be in, on the, in their email. Yeah. And hopefully if you're doing social media, you're going to be on their social media stream. So it all comes full circle. I don't know who to give credit for for this. I'll bet you it was holding. <laughs> um, coloring contests, like once a quarter or like a back to school coloring contest. Was no, that I, I didn't do that. Okay. So I thought there was someone that would do that. They would go around and just hand out coloring sheets. You know, you got your little branding on the bottom. Say, hey, color it, turn it in. Um, before school starts, we're going to draw one one out of a hat and that kiddo is going to get, you know, a hundred dollar bike or an iPad if you're feeling particularly generous or something like that. Some sort of little giveaway that you can do um, that gives you something you can hand out. Um, you've, you've given away turkeys. I've seen turkeys. Yeah, I, <laughs> I used to do contests like that in the farm. I, I don't as much for certain reasons, but uh, when I was doing that, it would be um, um, each holiday, um, like, a th Holden's Thanksgiving Day dinner. When when Holden's Thanksgiving Day dinner, and then I'd go to Ralph's and buy a thank you know a Thanksgiving Day dinner at Thanksgiving time and deliver it to their house and get a picture. <laughs> did you want to add anything to the garage sale thing, Tom? Um, no, we did the the Trader Joe's promotion too. That was a great way to get people to email us. And uh, one of our flyers was we were promoting uh, for Thanksgiving, like a gift card to your choice, Holden's Trader Joe's. Like a winner out of a hat. And what they have to do, they just had to respond. Yeah, they just, you know, and I mentioned they were like reading our flyer effectively <laughs> and then communicate with us and then they get on our uh, marketing. A few ideas if you're just trying to get started, right? We have a marketing class next Thursday morning, by the way. I'll be there. So, farming and marketing. I will be there. So, Holden, before we conclude, would you just go on about how you manage your garage sales? Uh, do they call you? Do they email you? You put them on a map, actually, don't you? For everyone that's participating? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I do everything that, that Brian uh, described and, and a few more things. Um, in, in terms of managing it, you're talking about all the details involved. Yeah. Um, so you advertise the garage sale for the community, right? Where do you advertise okay. it? So here's the thing. Um, one of the things that I tell everyone in my farm is, you know, I don't just put up signs. Um, I'm advertising all of the cities of Orange County to bring shoppers into the community. I have map cases with maps at each entrance to the track. Um, I do advertising on a bunch of, I have a, I have a folder of um, places that I do advertising through the city. Um, one connection through the register goes to about seven different newspapers, even in other languages. Um, I've got, of course, a post I put on Craigslist. Um, so I have a many, many different multiple means of advertising to bring uh, shoppers in. Now, here's the thing. A lot of agents do these garage sales, but in my farm, they don't anymore. Because again, I'm not, you know, stroking myself here i'm telling you what has happened because um there's our minimals Min there there's our minimal where mine because i'm advertising out of the area to bring all of these shoppers in this is not a joke my garage this happens every time in fact i have one in college park colony on may 11th and green tree on may 18th go drive you know, by yeah, if you don't, well, you're going to come in, trust me. If you don't believe me, watch. 
So we start at 7 a.m. Because of the areas I advertise, and this happens every time you've seen this, Cindy, 6 a.m., we have big trucks from God knows where driving around, <laughs> picking up, yeah. I'm not even exaggerating, yeah. picking up furniture. You know, these people in garages, <laughs> they're putting out big couches, stuff like that. Well, with Holden's garage sale, it's going to get bought, your furniture. I mean, it's 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 funny. Uh, we should take a picture of that next time. It happens every time. These people get furniture, tables, stuff like that. And then at 7.05, I get to, oh, with by the way, with the garage sale, um, everyone signed up on the map. You, this, is this, and this also, per what you were saying, I go to every single house that signed up um, with a, a big gift bag. I, I don't do donuts. I do a big gift bag. Hi, I'm Holden. You know, um, here, thank you for participating in my garage sale. I do this for you folks twice a year. They're all happy. Then we take a photograph with them. So I got a bunch of photographs of people in my farm from the garage sale. And guess what is on my next flyer that goes to every house and they see themselves on there with who? Okay. That's <laughs> advertising. And it sounds silly, but it, it makes, it, it's awesome. So um, th there's a lot that I do to this. Um, I go to every, everybody's house. Um, we have a lot of like, shoppers coming in so it's not just a garage sale it's like a freaking swap meet and it's awesome and quite honestly those are the main events i do now because it does enough okay any questions for this gentleman no thank you okay well i it's always interesting to see the difference that the different approaches. So yeah. I've got two different approaches once again. So any other questions before we conclude today's meeting? Too many. Too many, too many questions, questions too John. Many. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. I really appreciate it. Paul, then, Brian, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And you have to log out of there, too. Okay.